Hello everyone, I'm Bartolo for Gallery Teachers. We are producing a series of videos about TEFL, that is teaching English as a foreign language. And today we talk about how to interview people. And if you are staying with us until the end of this video, we have a special present for you. Our very special guest for today is Gabriel Clark, the author of uh, a very popular podcast about teaching English, that is uh, Clark and Miller English Podcast. He's also a writer for our website, a pro member, and one of uh, the top trainers of uh, our master classes. Gabriel, thank you very much for having accepted yeah. our invitation. Thanks so much for having me. Why do you think it's important for teachers nowadays to know how to interview people more than just asking questions? That's a really good question. Um, I guess there are a couple, a, a couple of angles on that. One is teaching in a way is giving interviews all the time because we all kind of teach communicatively to some level. In a way, a large part of our job is to just um, interview our students and, and ask and answer questions regularly and try to get them speaking. And I think one of the things that helps you be a good teacher, but also stops you from like getting burnout and stuff like that, is trying to find that thing in your student that makes them interesting. So like everyone has this one small thing. Even the most boring people in the world have something in there somewhere that is actually really interesting about them. So sometimes I find this is a kind of a cool challenge when you've got a really sort of uncommunicative, boring, dull student who doesn't want to speak much or doesn't seem to have anything to say, is to find that one thing that makes them really interesting. That is also like being a good interviewer. And I think a good interviewer outside a teaching setting is, is doing that too. You know, you're trying to bring out the best in your interviewee, especially these days we're teaching online, right? So we're, we're all like teaching on Zoom or, or WebEx or whatever, whatever platforms we've got. We, we're not with our students anymore. We can't read the body language as much. And also it's just easier to be distracted when you're online, play with their phones, people draw pictures. I'm drawing a picture right now here. You know, we just do this because we're not in the same room. It's a natural thing and that's fine. But it's really important to be able to be as engaging as possible and trying to engage the other person. When you're on Zoom and online, this is like more of a challenge and kind of more crucial. So this is like a lot like interviewing someone. You need to keep them <laughs> with you at all times. You are a celebrity. You are the author of a, a very popular podcast. I don't know exactly how many viewers you have, but it's uh, really good. I'm not um, sure myself. It's very difficult with podcasts to measure your listenership because it comes from so many places. But that's, that's another issue, sorry. I remember one episode that was uh, about how not to die in English. Yes. I like that. Good advice, I think. In an English conversation. It was very interesting and uh, I learned a lot from uh, that episode. At the same time, I'm uh, wondering what's the difference between teaching using a podcast and uh, teaching on Zoom? It's the interaction. It's the interaction with people. Um, it's amazing how much interaction changes everything. Um, it's not just simply that somebody replies or, you know, that you have a to and fro with your conversation. It's a dialogue, not a monologue. But it's psychological as well. When you know there's someone there and you can see them or you could at least sense them or hear the traffic in the background wherever they are or something, you know, you know someone's there. It changes everything. When you're speaking into a microphone in your room, It's very unnatural for us to do this. How do you make your podcasts interesting for the people that can't interact with you? You know, the whole reason I got into doing the blog and the podcast and making courses and, and all this stuff, you know, with Clark and Miller and all this content that I like creating is because I like creating it. And it's such a cliche, but do what you love. <laughs> do, do what you find interesting. And when you do that, people respond to it. So I basically, I only write stuff that I'm interested in. <laughs> Being interested keeps it interesting. When I prepare an interview, usually I think about some questions that I want to ask. I tell my guests that we more or less will talk about these topics, but uh, maybe the conversation will lead on uh, something else. Colleagues ask me, why don't I just write questions and then wait for the guest to produce a video with uh, the replies? And it's difficult for me to explain why this is not a good way of working. What do you think about submitting the questions and waiting for a reply versus having a conversation? Yeah, it's, it's a huge difference, isn't it? Because it's, it's uh, asynchronous versus synchronous. You know, it's happening at the same time. So you 
you have, um, oh my God, there's a world of difference. I don't know where to start. Yeah, you have this whole um, sort of conversational response uh, to and fro um, thing, which makes it like spoken conversation. When it's a question and a prepared response that's been, you know, done on different times, asynchronous, not at the same time, an asynchronous interaction, it's not really an interaction, then yeah, it becomes very formal, it becomes much more like written language than spoken language. And there's a huge difference between the world of written language and spoken language. And yeah, you get a lot less out of it. Somebody asks a question, if, and then somebody answers it, and then it gives the person who's asking the question an idea, or they might want to ask them to develop something. And, you know, it all builds, like, quite naturally when you're doing it at the same time. Like reading, I'm into music a lot, and I read a lot of uh, sort of band interviews, you know, music interviews by musicians online. And you can always tell when um, they've done that thing where they send the questions, then the band writes the answers, and then they send it back. And it's, it's just so boring. It just doesn't read well at all. It doesn't read like a conversation, even though they're pretending it's a conversation. One uh, job interview I had many years ago, and it was with uh, a professional recruiter. And uh, you know that they have a lot of questions that they have to ask. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions was uh, my desired salary. And I thought about that and I said, one million pounds. And she wrote it. <laughs> Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and I think this summarizes the difference between uh, having a genuine interest in uh, what the other person says and uh, just checking a box. Did you get the job? No. <laughs> <laughs> was it the million pounds? Or do you think that was that just... <laughs> well, it, the, the thing is that when uh, I'm nervous, I start joking and uh, people usually mm. don't get that I'm joking. It's just a way of protecting myself. But... I know that feeling. I get that. <laughs> I get that a lot. That's, I really like that, though, because, you know, that's, that is highlighting the absurdity of that question as well. Because, <laughs> you know, why does an employer ask that question? Because they know how much they want to pay their staff. Yeah. I would like to understand a bit more about how to make good questions and uh, mm -hmm. how to avoid uh, making bad questions. I listened to your podcast. Can you tell us about the theory behind asking questions to your guests? Again, you have to be really passionate about the topic. You can't really hold a good interview with someone if you don't really enjoy, if you're not interested in what, what you're talking about. It becomes like a, a conversation. And you want to have a situation when you're bouncing off each other as much as possible. That can work on a sort of equal level sometimes. You know, maybe you feel that you have as much knowledge as the other person, but you just have different things to offer and that's cool. And then you become sort of peers. Um, or, you know, if they are an expert in something, just basically be asking all the questions that make you interested in it. Yeah, I mean, you, you learn this when you're, a when you're training to be a teacher in the, at the beginning because, you know, someone's finished a task in your classroom, you, have, you can't let them just sit there and do, do nothing. This is um, what you're taught and what you're trained at the beginning. So, you know, you have to have something to give to them or you have to tell them to, like, expand the task or they have to be doing something all the time. So I think it's the same instinct there that things have to be moving all the time some questions that i call bad questions and uh, it's yeah. difficult for me to explain what a bad question is it's not a stupid question it's just a question that doesn't sound right do you have this feeling when uh, you're interviewing people i know what you mean i think um i don't do it myself but maybe i am guilty of that sometimes but um i see it at conferences a lot and meetings um and, and sort of workshops. I'm not talking about the workshops uh, I've done with Gallery, uh, but more the sort of um, offline workshops, real world workshops before the world changed. There's questions where people are asking the question not to get an answer, but to show off what they know. If somebody says, comes out with one of those questions and the, the, the person who's being asked the question just says yes, yeah. no. And you know, they, they don't, it doesn't elicit a real response. It's just an opportunity for the person who's, um, who's, who's up there to, to, to flex a little bit. So I think any sort of questions that have like a crit critical like a element, I think are okay. I don't have a big problem with them. What do you think about challenging your guest? Oh, definitely. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I don't think I've had any guests that I fully disagree with yet. So I, I can't really say that I've had to truly challenge anyone. But I like challenging the ideas um, that are being thrown around. And I think that's good. That makes a healthy academic discussion. And then, you know, 
by criticizing ideas, whether you're right or not to criticize, it's still good to because you address the idea and you look at it from a certain point of view and you get a better understanding. It can build a better conversation. As long as people are, are being, you know, not being aggressive or anything like that, I think it's totally cool. You improvise or do you study? Oh, absolutely prepare in advance, of course, uh, totally. Um, try to do as much research as possible on the topic, try to do some research on the person as well and find out what they've written about the topic, you know, find out what they're going to say, think about things you might want to challenge them with if you want to challenge someone. In a way, sometimes I've done a few interviews like this and they've, they've actually worked out really well. In fact, I think in a way that the best ones are the ones that I did, not forming questions, you know, necessarily a, a list of questions, although have those just in case. But be ready to even be kind of producing a narrative for your interview, interviewee and get them to start contributing to your narrative with their expertise. So in a way, you're kind of challenging them to become the interviewee. Otherwise, you become the interviewee. It doesn't always work. It all depends on the dynamic between the people. But um, learning everything you can about the topic you're going to talk about and then just start talking about it to the person, possibly in some sort of structured way. And then you get... a that sort of geek thing that I like to produce in the, in the interviews. What's your opinion about starting a new podcast? Yeah, if you've got something to talk about, then do it. Uh, I, think it's, I think anyone who feels that they want to do it probably have something to contribute. Um, everyone's different. So yeah, and there aren't many. There aren't many um, teaching ELT or ESL podcasts out there. There are quite a few ESL ones, but not so many ones for teachers. By the way, uh, teacher talking time as a podcast title has not been taken yet. And that's a really good one. But yeah, no, just go for it. It's quite tricky to start. I actually start like launched the Clark and Miller podcast by accident. I was just going through the like learning how to launch a podcast. And it's quite tricky. It's quite complicated. It's not like a blog post. You have to do all sorts of really weird, complicated stuff, which I can't remember anymore because I've done it and I want to forget about it. It's like, oh, okay. Oh, I've just launched it. Okay, it's out now. How do you find uh, people to interview? Yeah, I guess I go from two angles. Um, one angle is other people who are doing things like me. So you've got these sort of entrepreneurs um, who are out there trying, you know, running blogs, running other podcasts, YouTubers, whatever. Um, people who like helping people who learn English, whatever it is they're doing, creating content of some form and sharing ideas with them. That's often quite useful. And um, the other angle is my more academic angle and I'm, I still I'm very much in love with the whole academic side and you know I still read the journals and stuff like that and I still like there are there are a lot of people in the field who I admire a lot who are doing amazing work second language acquisition language teaching methodology stuff like that so I like talking to them but I just contact them it's really easy you just contact people you'd be surprised how how quickly people say yes Part of my activities are to explain people that once you have your teaching qualification, it's not just about teaching English. It opens your mind to many things. Where is the money coming from when uh, you are mm. opening a podcast? Because uh, it's uh, not something straightforward. You go and teach and then you get paid for it. Well, I mean, the podcast is part of something much bigger and that's clarkandmiller.com, the whole website with the blog and the podcast and products and stuff like that so i mean it all just sort of um feeds into each other you know we have, um, we have the blog posts um we sell stuff on style like a book or and courses on on the website for people who want it if not there's the free stuff like the blog and the podcast and it's all just there as part of this whole thing that promotes itself you know and if if we have something new or something we want to sort of recommend to people if they want to buy it then we, we just mention it on air or online if you set out doing this stuff only to make money it's it's going to be a really painful experience because it's going to be difficult to create content uh you can only create stuff well if you really like it it's just such everyone says this all the websites all the youtubers whatever this is such a cliche but it's so true like you need to be you need to put stuff out there that you feel passionately should be out there you know, that you think no one else is doing. I interviewed other people that are very successful on YouTube and podcast and the, in their area. And they say mm -hmm. that the passion is the most important thing and the money maybe will arrive later. When you check the adverts, it's uh, all about 
how I became a millionaire by teaching English and uh, see my swimming pool and my villa and uh, it's very easy and the money is coming. This is not reality. I can't it's, imagine a single English teacher who has a golden swimming pool in the world. Actually, I have to tell you that I'm in Tenerife at the moment and uh, outside oh. I have a swimming pool. No, <laughs> but, hey, yeah, but it's Tenerife. <laughs> That's pretty yeah. cool. You're in Tenerife. Yeah, oh, but fantastic. The, yeah, it, this is the point. So everyone has, uh, it's uh, part of the deal. So it's, uh, <laughs> you know, it's nice. summer all the time. Uh, I wanted to ask you, who is Miller of uh, Clark and Miller? Okay. Yeah, good question. Miller is my, my partner, like my life partner, but also my partner with Clark and Miller. Um, we, we, we started this all together. In fact, it kind of, it was her idea at the beginning. Yeah, we, we complement each other very well. She's very introverted. I'm very extroverted. She's very good at doing all the things that I hate doing. SEO, search engine optimization for the blog posts or doing the coding and, and the, the necessary stuff for the, uh, for the website and, and making sure the quality is high because I'm, and I'm very creative and I just like putting stuff out. If it wasn't for her, the quality of the whole, uh, our whole website and, and all our content would be much, much, much lower because she's, she's very good at making sure everything is like really neat and, and professional. So yeah, we're, we're a good team. We, we really do like our tasks are completely divided very naturally. The name of your website and where Ooh. to find your podcast, please. Yes, uh, check, check us out. Lots of free English learning and English teaching content at clarkandmiller.com. Clark like Clark Kent and Miller like the beer. Yeah, we got the we got a free blog, we got a free podcast, you can get some free ebooks. I think at least one is still up there. And there's also uh, some other stuff you can you can get as well if you want it. So yeah, check it out, clarkandmiller.com. Talking about free stuff, we have a present for the people that stayed with us until uh, the end of this video. And this is uh, gently offered by Gabriel, go ahead. You just need the passcode. Thanks, Gabriel. All one word. No spaces, lowercase letters. You will uh, access to his masterclass for free uh, instead of 20 pounds. So it's, it's good. It's a good present. Thank you. Anything else, Gabriel? Did you want to? No, uh, just thanks so much. It's, it's been really fun. And I really enjoyed this. Thank you. I enjoyed it as well. So uh, today we had Gabriel Clark and uh, I am Bartolo Ansaldi for Gallery Teachers. If you want to become one of our contributors or um, you want to get interviewed for this uh, channel, please write to us at editorial at galleryteachers.com and uh, we will uh, get back to you. Please subscribe and until the next time, happy teaching and happy learning.